Okay, good morning. Right. Good morning. Let's uh, begin, first of all, with a word of prayer. And um, let's see. Um, what happened to your mother, your dad? Oh, he's in the back. Oh, he's in there. I'm going to be sure to see how he's doing. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then I'll uh, talk to him and see how he's doing. Let's go. Heavenly Father, there's so much going on through the world that are so difficult for us in our lives. There's a great deal of negativeness, response that does not want to have Jesus Christ. So Heavenly Father, we have to make our decision. Is Christ important? Is the teaching of the Word of God is worship with one another, joining with one another, an issue. <coughs> Father, we pray this morning that everything we do will be glorifying to you, glorifying to your Son. In the precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, first of all, how you doing, Brad? Good, good. So what to, what to say of us? I had the biopsy Thursday, and uh, I got I guess the preliminary or visual inspection of it. Everything showed good on it, so I'll get the results back Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday? Yep. All right. So you'll let us know. Absolutely. Good. Yes. Please. Yep. Very good. All right. Um, any other prayer uh, thing, prayer requests or issues? I know I want to be in prayer for my friend John Hintz. He had a uh, went to the doctor and. Uh, he came out of the hospital Friday, but he's doing okay. So please be in prayer for John Hintz at this time. Yes? Um, be sure and keep my niece, Care uh, Sheila, mm -hmm. in your prayers. She uh, goes for her, uh, she gets the port put in on Thursday and then starts chemo following Monday. Mm -hmm. And also for uh, my sister, who is her mother, uh, she, they just learned she has a fractured tailbone, mm -hmm. and so oh, wow. she has a habit of just plopping down real hard in her chair. <laughs> there's no That's way so she, she didn't fall, she so that that's the only thing they can figure out how it happened. And so they're trying to give her something, you know, that they can help with the pain, but at the same time not overdo it. For her. Okay. So, um, get the, both of them at the same time here with something going on. Okay, very good. Any other? How's your mom doing? Jennifer. She's okay. She's okay? Yeah, she's she's not getting out of her chair very much. Sounds like me. Tish, oh Tish likes to stay in her chair too. So, that's all right. I didn't hear. Yes, sir. I think we'll pray for Bill. He's getting older. Yes. <laughs> Bill's birthday. It's your birthday? Oh, yes. yes sir. All right, how old are you now? Uh, 61. 61. Well, you're a young person. That's what I love about my church. I'm still a whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> you're very young. <laughs> 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 oh, we got four more birthday. years until middle age. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, just safe business travel for Debbie this week. Okay. She will be traveling? Mm -hmm. All right. You know, it's really interesting how for a long time a lot of them weren't tra are traveling at all, but now slowly people are traveling and their businesses are t sending them back. Yeah. Good. All right. We'll be in prayer. Thank you. All right. Any other prayer requests? All right. Um, I'm going to talk with you a few moments near the end of the day, our study, about church, and but uh, I'm just going to say a word right now about the offering, that it has always been a privilege for our Christians and in the Old Testament believers to be able to support the spreading of the gospel or the uh, help of born again believers. Now, through the church age, it has uh, been a great deal of stories and things dealing with the Bible 
especially with Jerusalem. Uh, Paul was always sending people or going with money to Jerusalem. And it is so important to be able to do that. Now, one thing I'm going to talk to us about is young people in this church, even children. But that's an honor. And uh, we have, uh, of course, the Friday, I uh, think, uh, summer, and then the slab. And we need to start thinking about the, the summer again, finances and prayer and things about that have to do with that. That's our privilege. So we need to have that in mind. Now, we're going to take an offering. Uh, we have a, a, a it's still out there, in the back. Yeah, yes. in the back. And, uh, but even now, we might start taking that in a while with the offering or the large table on uh, the first uh, next uh, uh, communion and next month, May. We're going to do it differently than we use. We're going to do it the way we've been doing it. And we're going to uh, worship here that way. And we've worked out a few little things, but uh, work out our communion together. Work out our offering together. Worshiping together. <clears throat> People, I want you to understand that the church is not just about coming in and learning. Most most churches do not do the teaching, but they come together. They pray, they do different things, and uh, but we've got to bring in the understanding of worshiping together and not forsaking the worshiping of yourselves with one another. So I'll do, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But right now, let's get ourselves into our study. Does anyone not have a copy? The Gospel and Forgiveness. Does anyone not have a copy? All right, everyone have a copy? Okay. We'll get two more up there. All right. The Gospel and Forgiveness. Do we have enough? Good, all right. So let's begin with developing into where we're going to be studying with a word of prayer, and then we will read uh, the introduction to Ephesians chapter 1. So let's begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, there is so much in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's not about our Christian life. It's about our being Christians. And Father, pray that your spirit will challenge us to understanding our relationship with you, with your son, with your spirit, and with your word. Pray that your Spirit will be effective this morning, Father, as we study and pray together. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. We're going to look at the gospel and forgiveness. But let's just read where we are in this study. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him in before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us, now we've spent a lot of time on predestination, predestined us, 
to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will, to, God, to the praise and glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Now, verse 7 is where we have spent uh, quite a length of time, but it has so much in it. In him we have redemption. So we had to study redemption. Through his blood, we had to study his blood. The forgiveness, which we're going to look at, we've already started looking at, and to it this morning, and of our trespasses. I don't know how many of you know the difference between a trespass and transgress, transgression. We're going to have to look at that. This is talking about trespasses here. According to the riches of his grace. All right. Let's take a look. The gospel and forgiveness. We two weeks ago started studying the forgiveness. Now I want to just look at the gospel and forgiveness. So let's uh, note these things together. Any questions, please feel free to feel free to ask them. One, it is so vital that we understand the gospel. Almost every preacher, teacher will talk about the gospel, but they do not mean the same thing as the Bible teaches. I know a multitude of preachers who teach a salvation by works, and they call it the gospel, and they call it by grace. If it is of works, it is not grace. We've got to be sure we understand what the gospel is. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. So it is essential to our Christian life to correctly understand the gospel. To be saved, to be correctly known to be saved, and to tell others how to be saved by grace through faith. One of the things we can do every day is meet people, work, life. Do you understand the cry? Do you understand salvation? Do you understand the gospel? Whatever way you want to word it, and tell them about Jesus Christ. Now that brings us to point two. Why the need of the gospel? Why the need for it? Okay. One, let us start with understanding there are two parts of the gospel as far as the unbeliever is concerned. One is negative and the other is a positive. Two, the negative is what is what we're uh, not know the, noting here, what we're studying. Forgiveness of all pers personal sins. There is nothing we can do to cause God to forgive us our sins. There are no works or amount of works we can do for the forgiveness of sins. Many preachers, people talk about forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Well, we've got a lot to understand about the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is by the personal work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way of understanding the forgiveness of sins. This is what he accomplished on the cross. Isaiah 53, one of the great, to me, one of the greatest presentations on the crucifixion of Christ, Isaiah 53, is an excellent place to study in detail all that Jesus Christ did on the cross. But the major issue of the cross is that Jesus Christ bore the judgment of all the sins of the world. Let's look at point three. We must understand the damage of sin. Just how horrible sins really are. 
Sin demands payment. Sins demand divine punishment because it is a violation of God's perfect righteousness. So, so many people are caught up on the love of God, but we must remember that he is also perfect righteousness. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. This is talking about spiritual death. And everyone since De De uh, Adam has been born spiritually dead and therefore cannot pay the wages of sin except for Jesus Christ who is born physically alive and spiritually alive. But people, we were all born spiritually dead. We we're all born in that sin state. Nothing we can do about it. So point four, but Jesus Christ was born spiritually alive and as well as physically alive and was therefore qualified to pay the wages of sin for the entire human race. If we would render his soul as a guilt offering. Now this is uh, spoke, spoken by God in Isaiah 53, 10. If he would render his soul, if he, Jesus Christ, would render his soul as a guilt offering, which he did for us on the cross, which brings up another very important point of doctrine on the relationship between God and the Father, God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.13 Jesus Christ is referred to as his beloved son. Question, do you know why Jesus Christ is the beloved son of God? Could you be able to deal with that? Talk to people about it. John 10, 13, 10 17. For this reason, here's the reason, the father loves me. Because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. It's amazing how many people are talking about love. He loves everybody. People, everyone is not saved. He loves everyone. He does not love everyone as he loves his son. We've got to understand love as it is one as what comes from God toward man toward Jesus Christ, toward unbelievers, toward believers, toward believers who walk in the Spirit, believers who do not. All of these things function according to his love. It's not the same love for everyone. So God the Father loves Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ laid down his soul as a ransom for the wages of sin of the whole human race. Now, Acts 5.31. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Romans 8, 3, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. And it's amazing how many people today, today, are so involved in the law, still want to have it, make it, make it a big issue. People, it is so weak. Now, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. How did he do it? Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So I'll slowly put these things together, understanding his love 
and why he has this love. Now five, he took away the sin problem on the cross. He, Jesus Christ, and actually he, God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit, but he was talking about Jesus Christ, took away the sin problem on the cross for everyone. Now, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is forgiven of sins. And everyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ as Savior is not forgiven. I'll come back to that, but I want you to understand it. They are not forgiven of sins, but everyone has been removed from the burden of their sins, from the punishment of their sins. All sins have been removed for, the, for sins. But forgiveness of sins is another issue. But this does not mean that they're saved. Because everyone has been redeemed from sin, taken out from sin, and they're removed from the sin that we were born with does not mean they are saved. This is why it is called the negative of the gospel. It moves the sin barrier between God and man, but does not save mankind. Six, the issue for salvation is the positive side. The issue for salvation is the positive side of the gospel. Being perfectly righteous as he is righteous. Be holy as I am holy. Or 1 Peter 1.16 You shall be holy for I am holy. The issue of being righteous is clearly seen from the ten questions of Job. But what I want you to grasp is, what's the real issue for salvation? Being righteous. Sins are no longer the issue. Jesus Christ moved those off from the cross. The great issue now is righteousness. The issue is not personal sins. Christ took care of that on the cross. The issue is God's perfect righteousness and our unrighteousness. For this we need the gospel. For this we need the gospel. How can we be righteous as God is righteous? How can we be holy as God is holy? Now, there are just so many hymns that are so thankful that our sins have taken care of. And I am, and you are too. But I want you to understand something. That's not the big issue. The big issue is righteousness. Do members of the human race have righteousness of God? No, they don't. Are they under sin? No. Sins are gone. But they are not saved. They are not righteous before God. And in seven, the ten questions of Job point out the need for our salvation. Now, I'm going to read through this. Read through quickly the ten questions in the book of Job that deal with what we're talking about. One, can mankind be just, righteous, before God? Job 4.17 the answer, of course, is no. But here's the question. Can mankind be just before God? Two, can a man be pure before his maker? Job 4.17. No. Three, does God, this one's important, does God pervert justice? What does that mean? Does God save somebody who is unrighteous? Does God do that? Job 8, 3. 4. Does the Almighty pervert? Oh, that was the Job, Job 8, 3. Now, 5. How can a man be righteous before God? 
Job 9, 2. There's the heart of our question. How can a man be right or righteous before God? Can you answer that? That's the issue. Six, who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. Some Bibles don't put in that word no one. No one. Satan says that. In Job 14, 4, who can make the clean out of the unclean? No one. And Job, uh, Satan likes that. We've got to understand something. God can and does. He does do it by imputing us with righteousness. That becomes the issue. Seven, what is man that is that he should be pure? <laughs> Job 15, 14. Because we're moral? Because we're wonderful? No. Not because of anything that we do. Hate? Or he who is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Now, this would cause a long time study, bringing in about the birth of, of a woman. Satan, no, the angels never had that. They don't understand that. That to them is low, being born of a woman. That's how we come into the human race. But we're born under sin. So it says, are he who is born of a woman that he should be righteous? At birth? No. <clears throat> At any way any works? No. There's only one way. Nine, how then can a man be just with God? Put all these things together. How then can a man be just with God. Job 25, 4. Also, uh, Job 25, 4. Or how can he be clean who is born of woman? People were all born with an inherited sin nature. That's how we're born. So the greatest thing is, how can we be clean when we're born with a sin nature? And then 8. The issue now is not our sins, but the absence of perfect righteousness before a righteous God. Being sinless does not save, but our sins must be forgiven, and they were forgiven on the cross. When presented their view of the gospel or how to be saved, Many people say that you have to ask God to forgive you. You have to do something for God to forgive you of your sins. This is not the gospel. This is not presented in the word of God. Jesus Christ bore the judgment of sin and they are no longer an issue. Now, the only issue is not sins but perfect righteousness. That's the great issue. The great issue is not how horrible people are. That's not the issue. What a horrible person someone is, a horrible sin is, how wonderful some people are, how clean and wonderful some are. It's not the issue. The issue is are you righteous? Nine, we need two things for eternal salvation. Two things. First, the forgiveness of sins, which can be taken care of at the cross. Secondly, the presence of perfect righteousness of God, which God imputes to everyone who believes. Romans 3.22 Even the righteousness of God, through faith, by means of faith, in Jesus Christ are all the for all those who believe for there is no distinction there's no distinction between Jew and Gentiles the idea so even the righteousness of God by means of faith in Jesus Christ for those who believe 
This has always been the issue of salvation, regardless of the age of history. Romans 4, 3, for what does the, self, the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Nothing about sin. Nothing about his sins. The great issue in Abraham and the study of Abraham was righteousness. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Verse 4 of verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Note carefully the word credited. For his faith is not credited. His faith is credited for righteousness. Note that word credited. This verb is in the passive voice. Now, let me talk to you just for a moment about Greek, Hebrew. For many years, get up and we'd say what uh, the verb was or the adjective or this type of thing. And, and there's okay to that, but that doesn't add much to people. So when I am going to tell you something like this now, I've decided, my wife told me to do this, what I've decided to do is to give a reason why. When I say that the verb is in the passive voice, wow, big deal. Yes, here's why. Let me show you. The passive voice means that the subject receives the action of the verb. That's what a passive voice does here. So when we talk about the, uh, having the credited, being credited for righteousness, if faith is credited in righteousness, this is a passive voice. The subject receives the action. Here, the person who believes receives the action. That is, receives righteousness. Here, the person who has faith receives the credit are reckoned as righteousness. This is the only way we can serve and ever be righteous before God. As we continue more and more, I will not be talking a whole lot about the Greek and all of that, but when it's, it serves you, gives you something that you can say, okay, I got, I got that. I'm going to do it. So that here, it's a passive voice. That means the subject receives the action of the verb. What's the action of the verb? Because righteous. So it receives being righteous. This is the Greek word imputation. When the one puts their faith in Jesus Christ, God imputes them with his perfect righteousness. And they are, at that point, justified. We are not justified by forgiveness of sins. Please let me repeat that. We are not justified by forgiveness of sins. We are justified when we are imputed God's perfect righteousness by faith. In Jesus Christ. That's the issue. Romans 4, 6. Just as Dave, David also speaks of the blessing uh, on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. This is Old Testament stuff. Made very clear to us. Please notice this is Old Testament New Testament. Got to understand these things. The gospel has always been by faith alone in the Messiah. In the Old Testament, 
wasn't known as Jesus, Messiah. Same issue though, faith for the imputation of righteousness. Abraham, David understood this aspect of the gospel. Romans 4, 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised, the Jew, or on the uncircumcised also, Gentile? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. And we're going to see before he was circumcised. That was the great issue. Faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Here is Abraham, not a Jew, not with a circumcision, but believed in the coming of the Messiah, was imputed with righteousness. Now verse 11 of Romans 4. And he received the sign of circumcision, a sign of of the righteousness of the faith. Not the way of righteousness, but as the seal of righteousness. He had already been imputed with righteousness. Continuing verse 11, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised. That righteousness might be credited to him. Doesn't matter whom we're talking with. Jew, Gentile. The great issue is, do they believe the coming of Jesus Christ? That's the issue. Not circumcision. Not uncircumcision. You gotta remember, we don't have much of a battle with this anymore. But you study Galatians. Boy, that was tough. They wanted to hunt and uh, look, find out if somebody that worked with Paul were circumcised or not. They, this was a good issue. So we have the issue. Yes, good. Sorry, I'm not thinking about circumcision right now. I'm thinking about what you were saying about forgiveness. And if... I know all sins were taken care of on the cross. So for the unbeliever and the believer, sins are a non-issue. The, the sins were taken care of. The question about forgiveness is, when, when you mentioned that uh, everyone who does not believe in Jesus Christ as a Savior is not forgiven of his sins, but they are removed from sin. So I understand the sins are removed, but they have not been forgiven of those sins. No. And then you also say, but our sins must must be forgiven, and they were forgiven on the cross. So is the issue that they don't believe that they've been forgiven because they don't believe that the cross took care of them? Okay. That's right. And I'm going to say more on that. Okay. I'm going to say more on that. This is uh, a problem that preachers battle this out and battle with it. And uh, the... Uh, the conference that we have in Dallas in uh, Houston, uh, this, you'll get into these kinds of things with other pastors, and just uh, uh, either at night or at lunch, and we got into this, and it was really fun because I was surprised the number of preachers that no, we're not, but there were some who said no, you you got to be forgiven. Of sins, not that that uh, wasn't going to be that if, if you weren't forgiven, and yet there were some that understood that. So I was very pleased that uh, I had some had that. Yes. Well, I th I think I see what Larry was saying that or that sin is not an issue, but what is an issue is our faith in Jesus Christ. So when God looked at Abraham and David. It wasn't their sin he looked at. He looked at their faith in his son. Yes. Now I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to righteousness or uh, the whole idea of the forgiveness okay. in just a few moments. And when we go through the eight or nine reasons, uh -huh. you tell me where you stand on it okay. in that regard. Okay. Now, again, credited 
Our imputed righteousness comes by faith alone. People, it is so important that our sins were forgiven uh, on the cross. But we are not imputed righteousness by the forgiveness of sins. We are imputed righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ. That helps, starts us. Okay. Now, the gospel imply, uh, includes both the negative, forgiveness of sins, positive, imputation of perfect righteousness, which is by faith in Christ. Romans 4.22, Therefore, it was also credited, in, uh, imputed to him, to him, Abraham, as righteousness. Now, point 11, uh, or major point, excuse me, major point 3, I want to put into our study. Let me get through it quickly, because I want to spend more time on major 4. But let's go to point 3, so you can be known in this area. Etymology of remission and forgiveness of sins. We're going to deal with remission and forgiveness of sins. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 is dealing with. There are two primary words for important that are important in the New Testament study. Charismai and Ophiemi. Our word Ophsis, which is in Ephesians 1 7 which is from the verb afiemi. So both of these words are important to us. First of all, one, both used of God. Two, both used of man. Three, both go back to forgiveness and carrying away from sin from, a, from a come the cross. Four, both used in the context of of forgiveness that leads to reconciliation there becomes a key issue forgiveness that leads to reconciliation here Ephesians 4 32 Colossians 3 13 and now they can look at charismai that comes from the whole idea of charis or grace to be gracious one used where God is one forgiving and where man is one forgiving. Two, used in context of forgiven for unbeliever and the believer. Three, used in context of forgiveness at the cross. Four, used in context of reconciliation. Charizomai comes from the root word charis, which means grace or joy. One, give freely or graciously as a favor. Two, give or remit, forgive or pardon. These words mean to pardon, to remit, to forgive. Afiemi means to let go, to send away as as in a divorce, to leave, to freedom, to give up to abandon, to cancel, to remit, pardon, to let go from one's self, dismiss, remission. Now, what I want you to see with so many different words, in a moment we're going to talk about this issue, forgiveness of sins, and how it's got to be forgiveness of sins, and there's not forgiveness of sins. When someone comes into the human race, they are taken away from the abandonment of sins. And sins are no longer an issue. Such things as uh, they are canceled. The sins are canceled. That does not mean forgiven of sins. It just means the sin has been taken away from them. They're no longer burdened by it. That's the idea. Remit. Pardon. These are things that happen. They're not remission or the commission of sins. That'll be in a moment. But they are have the sins taken away from. Removed from the issue. 
Now, Roman number four, with forgiveness comes the offer of reconciliation. This is so important. With forgiveness comes the offer of reconciliation. Doesn't come with the remit of sin, with the cancel of taking out sin. It's still there. But when reconciliation is involved, the issue of forgiveness is there, is there. With forgiveness comes the offer of reconciliation, which is what we call faith in Christ. Okay? Now, let's go through the procedure. As we go through it, if you have any question, please just raise your hand, throw something, whatever. <laughs> but let's go through it. One, begins with a friendly relationship in harmony with God. You're in harmony with God. Two, then the disruption of this relationship due to a wrong, sin, some complaint, some provocation. So this is the second part. In fellowship, in harmony with God, sin, now, broken. That goes to point three. This disruption, this sin, this complaint with God, from God, this disruption leads to interruption of the relationship. It ends that friendship with God. Stoppage of relationship with God. Now it ends the friendship with God. Service with with God. And involves uh, uh, enmity, anger, strife, hatred, resentment, vengeance, hostility. All of these are now developed. So that's how we are in the human race. So, point four. Humankind is in sin and there is nothing that they can do about their sins. They are separated. We are separated from God. So do you understand the fourth steps to this point? Started off with God like Adam. Sin. Now you have disruption. A break in it. Man is in sin and there's nothing he can do about it. So now we go to point five. So, at this point, God has his son to come and die on the cross and pay for the sins of the whole race. Jesus Christ removes sins. He does not result in salvation. This does not result in salvation. It does not result in forgiveness of sins. It simply moves sins from the <coughs> issue of mankind. This is very interesting this morning. Phil's off a study, and he talked about Adam and Eve. What happened there? Why there was a death right there at the very, very beginning. They, so what, what happened with uh, Cain? He offered God, oh, I'm, I'm with you now. A minute, and he's not, but I'm with you, God. So here's my offering. It's going to be some nice fruit. Some really good fruit for you. Best fruit on the earth. Say, and God says, no. It's going to take a death. It's going to take a blood. It's going to take a death. It's going to come my coming of my son. That has to happen. So we can start with Adam and Eve, all the way through our study of where we are. So at point five, why Jesus Christ? God decided that he would do something that would bring him back into a fellowship with man. Let's just say back to Adam. When he was in fellowship with God, became an enemy. And now because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, Jesus Christ provides the way of bringing them together. 
Isaiah 53, verse 10. But the Lord, God the Father, was pleased to crush him. Crush Jesus Christ. And the crushing presents the spiritual death of Jesus Christ. Putting him to grief. Sickness, uh, sickness of the guilt of sin. That's what was done. If he would render himself as a guilt offering. Therefore, we have no right to feel guilty. Jesus Christ was our guilt offering to the, full, to the holiness of God. The remainder of this verse, and I don't, I'm just going to give it real quick. The remainder of this verse is the blessings Jesus Christ received from God the Father for presenting himself as a guilt offering. Isaiah 53, 10b. He will set, see his offspring. What is that? All those who believe in him. He will see them. He will prolong his days. That's his eternality. Resurrection. After resurrection. And the good pleasure of the Lord God the Father will prosper in his Jesus Christ hand. That is, that all that Jesus Christ, all that God the Father given to Jesus Christ as God the Lord in the Lord's Prayer of John 17 is so beautiful in this study at this point. Now, understand where we are. Man's not saved. He's an enemy with God, but Jesus Christ has taken the sins away from him. So God looks down, sees no sin. Now, point six. Now, the only issue for every human being is to be changed, the, to change their thinking about Jesus Christ. Mankind is restored by the death of Jesus Christ. He is restored positionally as unbelievers and restored experientially as believers. So what am I saying? The offer... If he, if Jesus Christ has paid it all the, the penalty. Now, here is, an, here is an unbeliever, and here is the offer of reconciliation. Many will not even say yes. No, don't want it. Some will say yes. That brings us to point seven. And as process of reconciliation that removes all the hate and hostility this process is not to act as if the offense or sin is complaint, or complaint never occurred. For indeed they did. Jesus Christ had to die on a cross for them. So they did occur. This is the process of reconciliation. All that must be done to bring man into fellowship with Jesus Christ through the reconciliation by faith in Christ. Now, I'm going to read to you. I don't want it to be confusing, but I want to spend a moment read to you from uh, a lexicon by Herman Kramer, C-R-E-M-E-R. -E -E in this uh, lexicon, adds this on Afiemi. Quote, To send away, to dismiss, to set a free, Acquittal of accuse, of accuse to excuse to express the discharge or acquittal of an accused because with or without a judicial sentence the charge falls to the ground or the punishment is remitted and the guilty person is dealt with as if he were innocent. That's where we find him. Then Camera, Camera adds this very important addition to it. Quote, is offered, let me put on my glasses, if 
is often used in combination of propitiation or atonement, dropping the legal claims upon man. Forgiveness is letting go of all guilt claims. This is very important to realize for the unbeliever. No unbeliever will stand at the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennium for his or her sins. They are there because they have refused to believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. If God then, if God did, if God did not forgive all sins of the cross, then the unbeliever would stand in judgment for their sins. But this is not the case. No unbeliever will ever stand, have to pay for his or her sins. They will be eternally separated from God because they of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So, if anyone tries to tell you that Jesus Christ did not pay for the sins of all unbelievers, this would mean that they judged their sins, that they are that they're going to be judged for their sins, which, by the way, is what a lot of preachers do say. Jesus Christ died on the cross, bearing the judgment of all the sins. And the book of Revelation is clear on the basis of this judgment. Not their sins, but not their works, not their sins, but their works that they put in place of their faith in Jesus Christ. So here stands an unbeliever, and he says, I don't want to believe in Jesus Christ, Here's my, my good works. Let me tell you how good I am. All the good things that I've done. People, let me explain to you. A lot of unbelievers think sins, that we would call sins, good works. It might surprise you the number of Nazis who are thinking, who thought, I'm doing wonderful things here. Getting rid of Jews. I'm doing a wonderful thing for God. That's their good works. Others have their good works, their moral righteousness. Others, what they do and what they don't do. All these kind of things. But we come, they come before God. Here is the basis of all that are my good works. So they go before God with these things. Revelation 20, 11, Then I saw a great throne, and him who sat upon him, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. The scripture of the great white throne judgment. Verse 12, And I saw the dead, all unbelievers, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another, another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Not sins, their deeds. Their works, these good deeds that they are, they were depending on instead of just believing in Jesus Christ. And if you wonder why this wrath of God worked toward all who refuse to believe Jesus Christ as Savior. This is what's going on in this study. Isaiah 53, Revelation 20, 13 through 20. Let's look at Revelation 20, 13. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged. E every man, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and her Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. People, today, 
are so occupied with the love of God, but they better be aware of the wrath of God. There is a lack of fire for those who reject Jesus Christ. You better be aware of it. Verse 10, verse 10 of Revelation 20, and the devil who believed to be deceived them were thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone and were the bread and the beast of the false prophet also, that's of Jerusalem, and they were all tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 15, and if anyone name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Please be careful, faithful every day for the forgiveness of sins at the cross and that you are in the eternal book. Point eight, this process involves forgiveness. The barrier is removed from the process of forgiveness. A very important point about forgiveness is the word of God. With forgiveness comes the offer of reconciliation. Nine, many people throughout history do not desire to take reconciliation, therefore never receive forgiveness of sins. They are not troubled by sins there because Jesus bore the sins of the mankind on the cross, but they reject reconciliation with God and with Jesus Christ. Finally, now, all that each, that each, that each individual now, no, no, now is simply believe, to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. That's all that's left. Now, any questions? Okay, let me spend talk with you a moment, talk with you. This is for you, for everyone on listening to the uh, uh, things on network and all of that. It's been almost a year, it's more uh, since the uh, former 19 hit. Multitudes of people do not go to church. Many do listen. Listen. Some go to church. Many are going to church around the world. Right here in America. Drive around Plano. Churches. People coming back. People, the great issue is, why go to church? Is it just to be there, to pray, get along with each other? Or let me just ask you, is it just a major issue of learning? Growing doctrine? What, what, what is the real issue of the church? People, the church is about coming together, worshiping God together, Growing the Word of God, singing, praying, encouraging one another, encouraging each other. I encourage you. I don't know, and neither do you, what we have left before the rapture. We don't know what we have left in regard to America's freedom. But what happens? In about, uh, let's just say, 10, year, 10 weeks or 10 years or 10 months from now. And it's even worse. And you lost the opportunity to worshiping with others. It's amazing the people that commit their life into danger just to spend with other believers. To pray. To talk about the Bible. To encourage each other. That's what they're doing. They're not just staying at home learning. Learning some doctrine. Worshiping with one another. 
Spring Valley Bible Church, zero with young children. That's a tragedy. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. Some parents will come in with their child. People, we have many people able to teach our children. Many. Larry. Laura Gay. Dave. We have a lot of you, many of you able to go in the room out here. We used to do it. Used to go up here and go upstairs. Not anymore. <clears throat> Not anymore. What a tragedy. So we've got to decide what's the whole purpose of the church. What's the purpose of you going to church? Staying at home, learning some stuff. And I'll, I'll even add some good stuff. I pray it's some really good stuff. But is that all there is to it? Is that all that you go and listen to this? Or is it to come to encourage others? Smile with each other? Encourage various problems that people are having. One another. Why church? God, people, I hope it doesn't lose. I hope we don't lose it in America. But don't think we can. It's amazing the number of watching they, they to watch history. I had to what happened in Germany and then in other countries and around Germany during World War II. That'll never happen here. That'll never happen here. No, you don't think so? You don't think it can happen? Don't be naive. It can happen. We have guns. Our founding fathers set that down right from the beginning. <coughs> We're on the way of losing them. <coughs> what about our fellowship with one another? Where do you stand if not long from now, not allowed to go into a church? You've been get into trouble. What are you going to do? Same. You've lost the opportunity. We have some children. You have some children. And so you take two or three years of their life. Don't go to church. Don't go to church. You don't have to go to church. You might get diseases or something. <laughs> so you can't go. And then they lose that opportunity that opportunity of worship, that opportunity to work with other believers, sing, pray, give, work with in the young, young people. We've got a lot of opportunities still to be done right here. We need to start being back in prayer Bring us back some of the children. We'll teach them. What a tragedy it is when I think sometime of Spring Valley Bible Church and how much truth is known by adults in this church and not doing anything with it. We need to get back. We need to come back to the church together, forsaking not the assembling of yourselves, which is the, say, the uh, Sabbath, the, the way of letting many. Don't be that way. Let's <coughs> come back. Come back. Worship.
pray for one another, laugh with one another, heal with one another. We have a lot of opportunities with our young people. Let's take advantage of it. Let's take about it. So I ask you to join me in prayer for Spring Valley Bible Church. What goes on in this church? People, I'm so thankful to God for this church right now. With people we have, Phil, Kit. They, what I love about uh, what's going on is Sunday morning, New Testament. Wednesday night, Old Testament. It's there. It's there for you to study, to learn, to listen, to come close to it. Understand what's going on. The Old Testament, New Testament. That's what we're here for. Worship together. Courage with one another. What others have, what others need. So let's get back together in prayer for each other. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we think through the first centuries of the church, the battles that occurred, the wars that came, completely losing of Jerusalem, Christians having to hide running and hiding in caves, funerals, all these horrible things. We've lived in America hidden. We've been locked away with freedom even more of or so over people all over the world. This has been a haven, but now it's under siege. Freedom is under siege, but Heavenly Father, the gospel of the search is under siege. Too many preachers just talking up there, not teaching the word of God. So Father, we take now, pray now, you use this assembly, Spring Valley Bible Church, and come back to it. People will come back and pray. People will come back and worship with us. But somehow, Heavenly Father, and then some people, the children, want their children to learn and yet at the same time brought in with some others. Father, we pray these things for the glory of our Savior, for his purpose, his glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.